begin our, our time in the Word, we need the grace of God to understand the Word, so that was a very appropriate. It's so great to be at Sheridan Hills, and it's great to actually see somebody. Wow, wonderful. And to see you all that are watching online, we can't see you, but in spirit, we've been dealing this, doing this at New Life now for obviously as long as you have, and you're a little ahead of us. I'm looking forward to, to experiencing what we're experiencing here this morning at, at Sheridan Hills, and I'm especially glad for, appreciate uh, uh, Pastor Eric's uh, introduction and about the fact that they're starting school this week. Glory is so excited about coming back to school. She'll be one of those that will actually be on campus, and she can't wait to get back, loves her teachers, loves her friends, and we're very grateful for the, uh, the education that she's getting at, at Sheridan Hills. So I'm um, looking forward to s- sharing the word with you this morning. I want to share with you a message. It's very dear to my heart. It's very important to me, and I call it the promise of all promises. Promises. Promises are a vast theme in the Bible. As you may know, if you've been a Christian very long, you know the Bible is full of promises. And there are many worthy studies on the promises, obviously. Uh, what kind of promises? To whom are the promises given? Uh, you could study the unconditional promises, the conditional promises. Uh, you could study the basis of the promises. You could study even how to appropriate the promises. But at the end of the day, we need the ultimate basis of the promise. And it comes down to knowing the promise and then believing the promise. Believing the promise is real and believing God who made the promise. So that's what I want to talk about this morning in one particular promise of the Bible, which um, is really built on the ultimate promise of the assurance of our salvation. Isn't that really what a promise is? Isn't, isn't our assurance of salvation a promise? Of course it is. You become aware of the promise of salvation and its permanence and its basis, which of course is the finished work of Christ, Jesus dying on the cross, rising from the dead, and we focus on that promise to the point of belief. And like all promises, then we comfort ourselves with that promise, and the comfort is there. I believe many times the experience of, the, of a promise kept is that which the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. It's a comfort. It's an encouragement that comes to us. It's an inner work. And unfortunately, many people don't hang around long enough to experience this. God's promise many times it's not meditated upon, it's not appropriated, it's not actively rehearsed in our minds to the point of actually experience. Oh, we may agree that it's there, we may believe that it's there, but have we experienced it? So I want to run to the top of the mountain of all promises. If this one promise is true, and it is because it's coming right out of the words of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, then this one promise, if believed and is truly experienced, then we're helped and our faith in Jesus takes on a reality and a joy comes and a confidence comes in our life that we all want and ultimately God is glorified if you believe this promise. So let's look at the promise of all promises. Hey, did you know that uh, there is no uh, Matthew chapter 29? Do you know why? Because Matthew only has 28 chapters. Now, isn't that profound? (laughs) And that makes chapter 28, what? The last chapter, right? Which makes chapter 28, verse 20, the last verse of the last chapter. And according to Matthew, it's the last thing Jesus said before he ascended to the Father. And in that last word, he made a promise. I want us to look at that promise. Let's start in verse 16 of Matthew 28. Uh, I'm going to back up a little bit, and something very special is about to happen. I'm about to read the Bible, the Word of God. And when the Word of God is read in the congregation 
of the redeemed, something very special happens. In fact, when I'm done reading this, you've already got the message. My job is just to hold it in front of you long enough for God to allow it to work into your heart. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And here it is. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. The last thing Jesus said was a promise. Now, we're going to look at this promise very carefully. I want to look at it from four different angles uh, at first, four different Gospels as it relates to Jesus' last words on the earth. Obviously, not his final word ever. It's the last word on the earth. And the Apostle John uh, does not record uh, the final gathering, but ends his Gospel at the lake shore there with uh, Peter and and the disciples and Jesus and Peter had their talk, which really set the direction for Peter's life. But we come to Luke, and I want us to see Luke's version of this. Luke comes close to telling us the final words of Jesus, but he stops short, and I believe there's plenty of room for what Matthew recorded right here in Luke. And almost identical words are recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 1, which, of course, you know that Luke wrote as well. And so look at Luke 24 as we look at the final words and the final uh, experience of the disciples before Jesus and as Jesus um, ascended to the Father. They're they're there moving towards the mountain, and it says in verse 49, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, Jesus talking, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And you know what that's about. Luke records that in the book of Acts, chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit gathering the church together. So we're close to liftoff, but not yet. Verse 50, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Don't miss that. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. What an awesome scene this is. The disciples are gathered around. Jesus is lifting off the earth, literally, and he was blessing them. In verse 52, and they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Now, I want to make a little side comment here that is not related to the promise, but it's very important in this text. It says, while he was blessing them, he parted from them. So now he's parted. He was carried up into heaven. Okay, he's gone, right? Look at verse 52. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Do you realize what this is? This is the first congregational Christian worship service without Jesus physically present. And when did that happen? according to the text, immediately after Jesus left. And you say, well, what's the significance of that? I think it's very significant. The priority of the apostles on the worship of Jesus without Him physically present, they had always worshipped Him with Him there, but they, there's no record that we have that I know of where they worshipped Him apart from Jesus being there. They worshipped Him with Him gone, and they did it together the priority of worship in the church started as soon as Jesus left. They didn't go back to Jerusalem and said, hey, you know, I think it'd be a good idea. Why don't we have a a worship service? Jesus isn't here. They didn't wait that long. As soon as he left, they worshiped, and then they left. Folks, it is so important that we are together for worship. This is the priority of the church, and this is beginning to happen. 
And it's very important for us as soon as possible to be together for worship. I'm looking forward to that at New Life. If you had told me in my seminary days or in the first 25 years of New Life uh, Baptist Church's existence that there would come a four-month period of time where we couldn't meet for worship, I would have told you you are out of your mind. And that's what's happened. And it's taught us a lot of things. But one thing it's taught us is how important it is that we are together for worship. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the online thing has changed a lot, right? It's, it's changed a lot. I don't know what's going on here, and I don't want to speak for anybody here. But at New Life, I've told our folks, you know, when this is all over and, we're, and it's safe for everybody to be back at, in church, don't think that you're going to wake up one day and say, you know, am I going to go to church or am I going to watch the online thing? You won't have that option. That's going to be for people who cannot physically be at church because we're meant to be together. And right here in the text, we find the priority of worship in the church. Okay, that was just for free. Actually, the whole thing's for free. But um, let's keep reading what happened. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Okay, so if we look back at this happening from Luke's angle, we see that Jesus was blessing them as he was leaving the earth. A word, the word blessing or blessed in the Bible is always words. Words. What words did he say in blessing them? Well, I think that Matthew tells us. And it's very possible that as he was actually leaving, possibly even as he's lifting off the earth, he's blessing them, he's speaking to them the words which Matthew said. While he was blessing them, he was carried up. What words? Matthew tells us. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, we can't miss the rest, of course, of what he said because it's the Great Commission, right? It's so important that as he was commissioning uh, the disciples to go out into all the world, this is part of the last thing he said. Um, and we can make a whole case, we can make a whole sermon, many sermons, I guess, uh, about the significance of the fact that this is the last part of the last thing Jesus said was to go out into all the world. But if we go to the very end of what Jesus said, and I know that we tend to emphasize the, the Great Commission, as we should. That is our mandate, to go out and share the gospel. But we can't miss the very end of those words where there is this massive, all-encompassing promise that he would be with us. I am with you always. There's enough people here for me to ask you to say it with me. Would you say it with me? I am with you you always. You there sitting on your couch or at your breakfast table, whatever you're doing, let's say it together. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The last thing, the very last thing. What about Mark, the book of Mark? Very interesting. Mark ends his direct quotes uh, when, uh, of Jesus with the disciples uh, as they were reclining at the table, so they clearly weren't up on the mountain ready for Jesus to ascend. Uh, and then Mark fast forwards to the ascension but gives no dialogue of what was said there, which is fine, different angles, different views. But he does say this. Look at Mark 16, verse 19. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them. While the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. So look at what Mark says about this. After he had spoken to them, what did he say? Well, Matthew tells us what he said. He gave them the commission, the great commission to go out. And he said, lo, in other words, lo, Pay attention, look at this, behold, get this, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. So it's interesting, though, that Mark then records that the Lord worked with them, which was a direct statement about the fact that he indeed, as he promised, 
was what? With them. I think that's pretty wonderful that, that not only do we have the statement, we have an actual happening, a, a description that they went out to do the work and a very clear statement of Jesus fulfilling his promise. The Lord worked with them. So we have the promise given and the actual report that he indeed was with them in their lives after he ascended. And we begin to see the continuation of what had been going on during Jesus' ministry. He was physically visibly with them when he was on the earth, and he was with them, not physically, not visibly, but in reality, he was still with them. It wasn't an illusion or just some lasting impression or some kind of psychological game that they played, imagining Jesus was with them. The Lord worked with them. So the first encouragement I want to give you, and I'm calling these encouragements um, that I, I hope you'll write down in your notes there, whether you have them uh, online or here in the room, I want you to see this morning is that the promise of Jesus always being with his disciples, which includes us, as we'll see in a moment, is the very last thing Jesus said as he left. The last thing. You ever heard the phrase famous last words? These are famous last words words. Last words can be very powerful. The founding pastor of this church, Pastor Bill Billingsley, was my pastor. I listened to him preach hundreds and hundreds of sermons from right here as I sat right about over here. Uh, he had a huge impact on my life. He helped us start new life. He was one of the founding, the co-sponsoring uh, churches. And as you know, unfortunately, he, he, um, had cancer, and at 64 years old, went home to be with the Lord, leaving us rather in shock that, that this would happen. When he was in the hospital, uh, near the very end of his life, I, I wanted to go see him, and I figured this would probably be my last time. Unless the Lord did a miracle, this was probably going to be my last time to talk to him. And being on staff and having grown up in his house, basically, and and being very close to the Billingsleys, I had somewhat of a privilege to be able to go to his room. It was very late at night, and um, I walked, I'll never forget walking down that hall to go see him, thinking this will probably be my last conversation with Bill Billingsley. And I, I walked into the room. It was dark, and his daughter, Laura, was there, and she was reading to Pastor as he laid in bed there in the hospital with his eyes closed. And I walked in and quietly greeted Laura and pastor opened his eyes and saw me, and he said, hello, Mark, and I greeted him, and we talked for a moment, and he said, how's the church going? He was very interested in the mission churches of, of Sheridan Hills, and so I gave him a little report as best I could. He was very weak, um, really didn't open his eyes much, and then he said this to me. After I gave him the report of the church, he said, Reach those families, Mark. Reach those families, Mark. Those were the last words I heard Bill Billingsley say to me. And can you imagine how powerful that has been in my life? I've played that tape over and over in my mind. It has motivated me. It has encouraged me. It has disciplined me to know that the man that I respected so much, his God and his providence and in his sovereignty allowed the last words he said to me to be, reach those families, Mark. And I've relived that moment many times. But you know, as motivating and inspiring as that experience was to me, the one thing that my pastor could not tell me and would not have told me was Mark reach those families, and I am with you always. He couldn't say that. Now, he was with me in the sense of his, of, his, of his impression on me. He was with me in the sense of his words ringing in my ears, and the influence was there. But my pastor is not with me, but Jesus is. I'm not diminishing the massive impact that my pastor had on me, but there is only one that can say in truth, I am with you always. 
Last words. And then we need to ask, whose last words? Whose last words are these? Now, on your blank there, I left it long intentionally because there's a lot you could write in there. Not a lot of people, but only one, but he has many names. We're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, the creator of the universe. Put in there what you want, but this is who we're talking about that said, I am with you always. Last words of the greatest personality of the universe. So that's the first thing, the first encouragement I want to give you. Jesus' last words of a promise. Secondly, the second encouragement I want to bring you this morning from this text is the actual grammar of what Jesus said. He put his statement in an eternally present tense. Write that down. An eternally present tense versus a future tense. You see, the promise, I am with you always, could have been said another way. It could have been said, he could have said, I will be with you always. I will be with you always. But by putting it in the present tense, he made it the strongest promise. I am with you always. Now, if you check your, you say, well, that's what it says. Now, I've been, I'm reading the New American Standard uh, I know you're used to the ESV, but check the ESV out. It says almost exactly the same thing. In fact, check all the reputable English translations. They all say the same thing. I am with you always. Nobody puts it in the future tense because it's not in the future tense in the Greek. Jesus said it in the present tense. Another grammatical nugget here, that, uh, if you will, that makes a difference is that if you translate it literally, he said, I myself am with you always. We don't tend to talk like that, so the English translation kept it with I am. But the emphasis is I myself, me, I myself. Who? The Son of God. God the Son, as we said. The one who made everything. I myself. This one is the one who is with you always. So let me bring it into our way of thinking. In other words, wherever you are, whenever you are, the words that Jesus wanted in your head and in your heart are these. I am with you. I mean, it would have been great if he had said, I will be with you, right? You would have benefited from that. You get in a place where you need the comfort of God, and you could say, well, Jesus said, I will be with you. I'll camp out on that. But there's a crowning extra by Jesus saying it the way he said it, when he said, I am with you. At any time in your life, you can say, disciples, I am with you always. Now, before I say anything else about this promise, if, if, we begin, or we, if we begin to appropriate that promise as a very literal promise, a present tense, no matter what, in any and all circumstances kind of promise, both difficult and joyous circumstances, what if God's people, folks, what if God's people begin to seriously and consciously live by faith in the Son of God, as Paul described, by hearing with their heart and mind the words from Jesus, I am with you. What if that happened? What if that was going on continually in our minds, in our psychology, in our hearts, in our spirits, in every part of us? Can you imagine the difference that would make in our lives? I am with you. I myself am with you. I am with you. So let me just stop right there for a second and ask you, are you aware of this promise? Are you believing this promise? What are you dealing with in your life right now where you need to know that the Lord is with you? Think about it. In whatever you are going through, what if, and this is, I want you to write this, these two words down, 
What if your controlling thought was this promise? What if the thing that guided your life and controlled your spirit, your controlling thought, what if it was this promise? I am with you. You say, well, you know, Pastor, everything's going really good in my life. Um, there's nothing really challenging right now. I don't know what planet you would be on if you said that, but um, literally, but planet. But um, you just said, man, life is just going so good, I can hardly believe it. You know, I, I've never laughed so hard, maybe I've never laughed so hard, as when my father and I were driving down to the Keys on Card Sound Road, and there was a toll booth there. It's not there anymore. But there was a toll booth, and it was, in the, it was right before or right after a hurricane, and we went down very early in the morning. It was like 4 o'clock in the morning, and there was this lady in the toll booth, and she looked so forlorn, and she was so just kind of bored, I guess. I don't know, and we pulled up, and, and uh, her name was there on a plaque, and my father, who's very enthusiastic, if you know him, said, well, hello, Millie, how are you? She said, I'm okay, how are you? And my dad, in his way, said, I'm doing so good, I can hardly stand it. And she said, yeah, I can hardly stand it either. (laughs) Uh, But get this. Even when you're doing so good, you can hardly stand it. You're on the mountaintop of basking in the blessings of God. Get this. You can still believe this promise. And actually... It's very wise that when things are going really good in your life that you still hear Jesus saying, I am with you because it may be going good and it probably is going good because he is with you. So our second encouragement according to the text in Matthew is that Jesus' promise of being with us is an eternally contemporary thought. It is eternally present tense. At any given moment, now and in the future, Jesus is present and the promise is now. Say it with me. I am with you always. Okay, third encouragement. The third encouragement is the context of the promise, which is the Great Commission. Write that down. The Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? That we are to go into all the world and make disciples. And then he said, lo, I am with you always. The disciples, if you think about it, went out changed men from this time on, right? They went out and they did proclaim the gospel. And if there is ever a time when you need to know that he is with you, it's when you're sharing the gospel. And it does make sense that when you are reaching out in any shape or form to bring someone or a whole people group or whatever, for that matter, to Christ, you believe, you read, you hang on to this idea that I am with you. After all, you're working for him. You're going out in his name. I mean, that is what he told them to do, and to do it, they will need him to do it. So really, this promise, in its most immediate context, is given in the context of the missionary spirit of the Great Commission. Evangelism, missions, proclaiming, sharing, having gospel conversations, engagement, right? You know, as I think about it in my own life, the times I have felt the presence and the help of Jesus the most was when I was actually speaking to someone about him. Actually, felt it. You know, some people say, You know, I believe in Jesus, and I even believe that this is true, but I wish I could really sense his being with me. I wish I could just feel that. Okay, well, one of the best ways to experience the presence of Jesus is to start a gospel conversation. I mean, that is the context of the promise. (laughs) Or start a relationship with someone with the view of sharing Christ with them. And when you do that, you are in the very atmosphere of how this promise came about. There's just something about stepping out in faith and opening your mouth with the gospel that God blesses with his nearness. It's not the only time that he does this, obviously. 
but we cannot deny the context of Jesus' promise. So you can count on the fact that every time you attempt to reach someone who is lost, Jesus is with you. You're trying to get your courage up to bring it up. Maybe what would push you over the edge is to remember, Jesus said, I am with you. He is with me. I, I can do this, not because I'm strong. I can do this because he's with me. He's for me. He promised. What would happen if we really took that to the bank of Jesus' promise? The context of evangelism with the promise of all promises. But there's another modifying word here in verse 20 that really makes this not just about evangelism, but all areas of life. And we have the presence and the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is my fourth encouragement to you of the promise. Jesus said, I am with you, fill it in, always, always, at all times. And you know, Jesus gave no disclaimers about this. He didn't say, I am with you always, except when you fall down and fail. I am with you always, except when I'm at my peak season of running the universe and I'm really busy. He didn't say, I'm with you always, except when you're doubting me. In fact, did you catch what Matthew said in verse 16? Look at that again. He says, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some were doubtful. Now, this is the 11 disciples. This isn't the crowd. These are the closest to Jesus. And it says, very honestly, thank God for the honesty of the Bible about the people in the Bible. Some were doubtful. And if you keep reading, there is no indication that Jesus directed his words that he said right after that only to those who were at the top of their faith game. And I put that as notes because I want you to write that down. People who are at the top of their faith game do not have an exclusive right to the promise that Jesus will be with them. No, apparently he directed the promise to the whole bunch. And some of them were struggling. But apparently the grace of God and his promise was given to them too. Now that's very encouraging to me. Because that means that when I'm struggling or even filled with doubts or wondering or discouraged, even in my faith, I don't have to worry that Jesus is no longer with me. Because the promise was given to people who were doubting. Nope. Think about Peter. He failed. Failed miserably. Denied the Lord. After all he had seen. And Jesus is saying, I am with you always. And can't you just hear Peter saying, even me, Jesus, even me, I denied you. Even you, Peter. Even you. I'm with you always. So if the conditions we are in are dire, it's still always. If you're racked in pain in your body, it's still always. If we're in a situation that unless God does the work, it is not going to get done, that's always. If you're enjoying success and fruitfulness and seeing the hand of God, still always. If you're feeling down and filled with regret, guess what? You're still in the always position. I'm with you always. Put it this way. He takes your typical day, your typical day. That's why I wanted you to write that because that's what's going to happen this afternoon and Monday and Tuesday. He takes your typical day, and that is still always. So always, I am with you always. What an encouragement. Okay, the final encouragement. The promise of all promise. Promises. The promise of all promises is for all believers. It's for all believers. This promise Jesus is making to his disciples in the first century, 2,000 years ago, and consequently to all those who came after him. And you say, Pastor, are you sure about that? I really am. Let's, let's explore the, uh, that because one of the things you need to ask yourself when you are considering a Bible promise is, who does the promise apply to, Right? Did this promise apply to all Christians who were to come? 
Well, I think the question is answered in the very next phrase. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That is a reference to the return of the Lord. The return of the Lord. Matthew 13, 37 is one of the places, the parable of the wheat and tares, the hidden treasures in the field, the dragnet, all those parables. Jesus brings it down to a close in verse 49. He says, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The judgment that comes with the showing up of the king. And that's what the disciples believed, apparently from other things Jesus said for them to know the term, end of the age. Look at Matthew 24, 3. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when these things will happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. So in Matthew 28, end of the age is most likely a reference to the Lord's return. And the point is this, to the question, does this promise, I am with you always, apply to all Christians? Sure it does. Why? Because the people that were hearing him say this the first time when he was on the earth died before he returned. So that didn't happen in their lifetime. He said it to them, but he said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That hasn't even happened yet. So where does that leave us? In the sphere of the blessing. It's for everybody. There's going to come after them until his return. So if you're a Christian, you can claim this promise as true in August of 2020. August of 2020. I wanted you to write that down because that's where you are right now. August of 2020. And this is very significant. It wasn't the first time that Jesus made a statement like this uh, where he applied his promises to future Christians, which would include us right? The people in this room. In the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John 17, look at what he said. Verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, Jesus is praying for the disciples, but for those who believe in me through their word. Who's that? Everybody that came as a result of their word. Their word was written down, preserved, and given to us in our own language. We are those people who believe according to the word of the apostles. And so Jesus' prayer applied to us, just like his promise does. So here's the deal. I want to take this promise all the way to the bank. All the way to the bank and rely on it at all times. And I believe that most Christians, well, I think all Christians want to do that. If you don't want to do that, you got a real serious problem. You need to check yourself. Christians in general want the presence of Christ. They may not experience it. They may, not even, they may even be ignorant of the promise, but they they crave that. They want that. They want Jesus. There's not one situation, one issue, one time frame, one mission, one trial, one victory where this promise does not apply. And it was the very last thing Jesus said. Think about that. The very last thing he said on earth. He wanted us to know that he is with us. So, we can just know the promise, believe the promise, and start thinking where we need to apply it. So, let me close with that question. Where do I start with this? Obviously, this is a huge study. I'm really just breaking the ice with, the, I hope, the most powerful point of the study of promises because we're beginning at the pinnacle. So let me give you five quick things. Number one, you start where you're sitting right now. That's where you start. This is part of always, this moment, wherever you are right now. This is always, right? I am with you. And somebody might say, but that doesn't solve my problem. It might not erase the problem, but it sure does bring perspective and comfort to know that he, that he may not remove the problem, but the fact that you are not alone in this problem is everything. And we can really camp out here, can't we? Getting the value of his presence and his help of Jesus in all things. 
course. It just changes my whole mindset that in my distress or my concern, my fear or my obedience, even, even if I'm called to do something, I'm like, okay, I, I see what I need to do. Oh, that's going to be hard. I need, I am with you always. And you go. Listen, even one of the names of the Messiah encourages you this way. Matthew 1, 23 is quoting Isaiah 7, 14. We know the very names of Jesus. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means, say it with me, God with us. The promise is really a fulfillment of how the Lord wanted us to know him. Number three, you just need to think about this and consider that the saving grace of every Christian really does come down to the fact that Jesus did not just do something for us as important as what he did is, and we base all, all of this on his death and resurrection. But he didn't only do something for us, he's with us. It's not just a past thing. The past thing was to create a present thing that we would be with him and he would be with us right now. Right now. So in your bulletin and online, you were given a card. You can print it out online. Some of you already have it here. There'll be some extras in the foyer. And it says, I am with you always. And here's what I want to encourage you to do, just to kind of keep this in front of you. We did this at my church, and it has been a great encouragement to our people um, I've even seen this on dashboards of cars. Uh, it, it's not an icon. It's not an idol. It's a statement. It's to hold Jesus' words in front of you. And if you're trying to be more mindful of God's promise, you've got to keep it in front of you. So one way or the other. This is one way. This is one help. Just one thing to leave with you. And I hope that you'll take that and you'll put it in a prominent place in your life to remind you and help you until you begin to start thinking eternally about this, continually about his great promise. So use the card. Number four, pray the promise. Confess it as true. Lord, you said I am with you always, and I believe it. Whether I feel it or not, I believe you are true, and you would not lie. You confess it as true. You ask God to strengthen your faith. Ask him to make it real to you, and I believe God is glorified when we are aware of that presence. And the fifth, where to start, is not just a, a sample prayer, just one, I, one way to pray it. You can just say something like this. Lord, I believe your promise that you're with me always. Now bring it home to me, Jesus. Open my eyes to the evidence of your promise kept. I believe if you pray that, if you ask God to open your eyes to his presence in your life, that he is with you, you'll start to see things you didn't see before. In fact, you could start a whole testimony uh, time of, of, of the answer to that prayer. It's just a place to start. Just a place to start. So this morning, what I've said and everything I've said is for those who have put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can count on the promise. It's yours. If you have not put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have never given him your life, if you've never repented truly of your sin and put your faith only in Jesus and what he did for you at the cross, plus nothing, not your good works, not your church attendance, not all the things that you're trying to impress God with, if that's never happened, this promise doesn't apply to you yet. But when you do, you enter, when you say yes to Christ, when you give him your life, when you ask him to save you, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's another promise, by the way. And if you call on the Lord in repentance and faith, he will save you, and this promise will be yours. So I invite you to Christ. I invite you to a promise that he will be with you for the rest of your life and all of eternity. So I hope you're encouraged, church. I hope that you will take this and run with it. What you do with it next is between you and God. And the grace of God, I believe, is evident and available to actually say, I now believe the promise. He is with me, and I want to live according to that promise. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, 
words don't, human words don't adequately embrace everything it means that you are with us. But Lord, we've taken your word now and held it in front of our eyes and our hearts and we're asking you now to give us the grace to believe it, to act on it, to remember it, and that your Holy Spirit would take it and encourage us in whatever we're dealing with in life, whatever we're going to deal with, the difficulties and the victories, the great commission that you've given us to go out, Lord, and we've been timid or or we've been shy, or we've been reluctant, Lord, maybe it's because we're, we're not remembering you're with us. And so, Lord, I pray that the reality of it would be so powerful that it would unleash us to go and do what you've called us to do. There may be people watching this, Lord, right now in a hospital room or bound to a bed somewhere or going through some difficult thing where they just have forgotten that you are with them. And I pray that the reality of this truth and the appropriation by faith of it in their hearts and minds, even saying, Lord, bring it home to me. Let me see where you're doing it, where you are with me. I I pray, Lord, that it would unshackle their hearts and they would burst into a new joy and in a new freedom and a new faith that would take them to a new place with you where they will glorify and praise your name because they've seen that you kept your promise. We thank you, Lord, that it doesn't apply only to 11 disciples on a mountain 2,000 years ago. But your promise that I am with you is right here and right now. And for that, we are very grateful, eternally grateful. I pray this in the name of the one who made the promise, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, the creator of the universe. Amen. Friends, let us stand together.